So if you ever wondered what the hardest part of learning CBT for psychosis might be, strangely enough, for most people, it isn't so much learning how to practice any of the techniques. Instead, especially for anyone already trained in some of the more conventional ways of looking at psychosis, the biggest challenge is often learning um, how to think about psychosis in a way that's more compatible with CBT. Using, um, so the challenge is to use a more normalizing understanding within our own thinking about psychotic experiences. So on this video, I'll be describing some of the important ways CBT therapists think about psychosis differently than most mainstream approaches. And I'll also be touching on how you can learn to think and talk differently about some of your own experiences in a way that will make you a lot better at normalizing. Um, a key thing to, to realize in order to practice normalizing successfully is that it's something that needs to be woven throughout every aspect of your interactions. So normalizing is used in, in CBT starting with the assessment phase and all the way through to the end. Um, though sometimes, of course, you'll be more focused on uh, normalizing than others. Um, my point here is that you aren't going to be able to do that effectively unless you work hard to understand psychotic experiences generally with as much of a normalizing perspective as possible. So let's really look at, at how to do that. Right, now, so a really basic concept within the, the CBT perspective is this idea of a continuum of experience. Normalizing explanations involve seeing psychotic experiences as just variations or possibly more extreme versions of everyday experiences and issues. So they're, they're kind of like understandable exaggerations of normal functioning and not like exotic symptoms that are imposed on the personality. So these kind of explanations look at psychotic symptoms in terms that presume that they could happen to anybody given a certain sequence of events. And so that, that kind of perspective kind of contradicts the notion that only a certain type of individual could have psychotic experiences. So there's no assumption, for example, that only people with certain genes can end up with psychosis. Um, you know, research does suggest that genes can cause, you know, some people to be more vulnerable to having psychotic experiences. But if enough things go wrong, it may be possible that any of us could get caught up in be being psychotic. And that's kind of like noticing that while some people are more genetically vulnerable to sunburn, any of us can be sunburned if we stay out in the sun too long. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's just kind of contrary to, you know, the, the notion, for example, that people can be decisively um, categorized as either sane or insane, mentally ill versus not mentally ill. Um, and, but if we look at research, it really tends to back up the continuum idea. You know, people don't come clustered in discrete categories like mentally ill versus not mentally ill, nor do they come discreetly categorized into categories like schizophrenia versus bipolar. Uh, instead, they're spread out all over a continuum with lots of people in, in between zones and, and that sort of thing. And a, a key advantage of this continuum idea is it allows people to more easily conceptualize crossing over from relatively more disturbed to being, you know, gradually less disturbed and less disturbed until they're you know, only modestly disturbed and they're like everyone else and they can get on with their lives. Um, and that's easier to think about than thinking, oh, I'm mentally ill and somehow I have to figure out how to be not mentally ill if, as a category jump. It's a lot harder to imagine. Um, so it's just a more hopeful perspective. But when some people are trying to get a grasp of the, the continuum idea, uh, what they have a hard time reconciling it with is the way that sometimes people seem to have a really um, definite break with their normal functioning. You know, the idea of a psychotic break and, and that 
it just seems like something totally different starts to happen. And how can you reconcile that with the idea of a continuum? Um, and one thing that idea that really is helpful there is the idea of the tipping point. Now, we see this in all different kinds of phenomena, even something as simple as water and temperature. Uh, water temperature obviously exists on a continuum, yet at a certain point on the continuum, the form of water changes quite dramatically, let's say from water to steam, um, when temperature crosses a certain line. So similarly, when a person's stress becomes overwhelming in some way, they can cross certain lines where it seems like everything changes. So let's take an example of a person who starts out with a really normal worry, like let's say that their partner might be cheating. Now, as that worry escalates, at a certain point, the person might quit balancing their worry that maybe the partner is cheating with the possibility that, well, maybe their partner is not cheating. So at some point, all they're thinking about is, gee, I think my partner's cheating. And at some, that point, they might kind of like really cross a line and actually like accuse their partner of cheating, and which can lead to all sorts of chaos. You're crazy. Why do you think that? Um, there might be a breakup and divorce. So the point at which the person um, begins forgetting that the worry is just a worry and sees it as a fact and acts on it, that's where they've crossed a kind of tipping point. Um, even though they started out with a very normal worry. Now, another direction it could take is where the person um, starts seeing their own worry as something terrible that they shouldn't have since it's so unpleasant and doesn't seem to be based on enough facts. So then maybe let's say they get preoccupied with trying to stop their thoughts. So that's one kind of tipping point. They've gotten so upset with their worry, they're now trying to block their thoughts. But that could lead to other possible tipping points like let's say that maybe the thoughts start to intrude anyway in the form of voices. And, and it, so that point would be like another tipping point. So I hope what you see there is that there's both the existence of worry and distress on a continuum and the possibility of dramatic changes as things become more extreme on that continuum. Now, in addition to the continuum idea, another key idea within normalizing is understanding that conventional ideas about what's normal tend to be way too narrow. Um, and then sometimes um, our clients have ideas about what's normal that's even more narrow than those which exist in the culture as a whole. Um, so expanding people's idea of what's normal can be a really helpful method. Now, one, one thing you often see is people believing that the contents of their mind are just supposed to be the things that they're consciously, they've consciously thought of and things which make sense to them. So they'll often think that anything formed of their conscious mind must have come from telepathy or a spirit or a brain implant or something. Like a common line of reasoning is like, my brain couldn't have come up with that. So normalizing is often about looking at how in dreams, our minds invent all sorts of bizarre things and characters and, and, and whatever that our conscious minds would never have invented. And in something while dreaming while awake, something like dreaming while awake can happen under certain conditions. You know, voice hearing, for example, as I stated in an earlier video, is a relatively common experience in the population. Um, you know, like different studies have found different things, but 8% of the population will experience an episode of voice hearing is what it said in this particular study mentioned on the slide. Um, of course, people have even more, a, a wider percentage of the population has heard voices at times, like just somebody calling your name when they, there's really no one there calling your name. It's a very common experience. Um, but there is particular causes can make this more likely, sleep deprivation, grief, having undisclosed trauma, emotional abuse, bullying, drugs, obviously. So being aware of just how common this stuff happens can, can help people. Another thing that can help people, um, this is a bunch of uh, pictures. You might recognize some of these people. 
Some of them you might not, but there's an accompanying slide which has their names. And uh, what's important about these pictures and these names is that these are all uh, famous voice hearers. They're people who uh, reported hearing voices. And using examples like this, and including maybe the, the pictures and all that, um, can really help people understand that the experience of hearing voices doesn't have to be interpreted catastrophically. It doesn't have to mean people have to think of themselves as defective for hearing voices. Uh, so it can be a really important part of uh, educating people about the, the breadth of what's actually within normality. Now, I, I got these slides from Doug Turkington, and he admitted that it could do some updating to appeal more to young people. For example, he doesn't think uh, most young people today know who the Beach Boys are, for example. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to shift a little bit now and to something a little more personal. Uh, now, if, if psychosis is on a continuum with everyday experience, then it follows that everybody, including the therapist, has had experiences that are very similar to psychosis, if not, frankly, psychotic. And therapist self-disclosure about these kind of experiences is a helpful part of normalizing in, in CBT for psychosis. So that means talking about experiences you might have had, like walking into a room, people are laughing, and maybe worried, are people la are they laughing at me? Or something as simple as hearing someone say something, and then it turned out they didn't really say that. Or um, feeling your cell phone vibrate and then checking it and finding out, oh, no one had called. That, that at this point may be becoming one of the world's most common tactile hallucinations. Uh, but, it, you know, it can also be more dramatic experiences. Um, some of you um, have probably had experiences under the influence of drugs that might be valuable to share. I can sometimes share um, how the first time I took LSD, I had the experience of actually like getting in touch with with people or beings from another kind of dimension who then informed me about important secrets of the universe. And then when I came down from the drugs, I continued to believe that what I heard and experienced was incredibly important. And, and looking at things that way actually set off some things in my life, some of which were you know, bad and disturbing and others which were good and actually valuable. And I'm gonna talk about some of those experiences a little more when I get into the module on formulations and personal stories. Um, but looking back on it, one thing I can say is that I was very fortunate at the time to have had a friend who knew something about these kind of experiences and helped me find some frames for understanding it. So again, why is it important to talk about these kind of experiences? Well, it can really help your clients you know, expand their idea about what's normal and feel more like um, they're part of the human race because people like you who, um, you know, are, are functioning okay also have had odd experiences. It can give them a lot more confidence in how you might be able to understand them and, and help them cope successfully with what's going on with them. So, what I'd like you to actually do now is a little assignment to, to think about one or two experiences you've had that are really on a continuum with psychotic experiences and converging towards psychotic, if not frankly psychotic. And then think about how your own experiences could have been more intense or confusing if certain factors had been different in your life, such as if you'd been functioning on less sleep, you had less social support, if your stress at the time was way higher. And, and then tell us about how your experience, then tell us about your experiences and your thoughts about them in the comment section. And doing this assignment will give you practice thinking about how your own experience fits on this continuum that we're talking about. 
And it will also give you practice talking about it and sharing it with others, uh, which, is, which is helpful to you. So I really hope you share because doing that is also going to help everybody learn from each other. We could get some interesting discussions going. So thanks.